Hello, and welcome to the Less is More Education podcast with your host, Steve Flores, where I review the research that is most relevant to pedagogy and education policy to help teachers in their ongoing learning. Uh, This is episode 30. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Like and subscribe to on Apple Podcasts and Spotify to keep the podcast going. Uh, you can find and reach me on Instagram and YouTube at lessismore.education or on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash lessismoreeducation. And today I'm going to review the book Teach Like Finland, 33 Simple Strategies for Joyful Classrooms by Timothy D. Walker. And uh, I'm kind of excited about this. And to kind of explain why, uh, the way I kind of look at my teaching career is I imagine like, okay, my credentialing program, I imagine it like a race. And my credentialing program provides me with like the vehicle that I'm going to enter into this race. And so I get into my, my car, I've done my credentialing program, I'm off and I'm running and I'm teaching. And at first I have like a really hard time just getting this car to move forward. Right. And every teacher struggles their first couple of years. And then so I'm having a really hard time. Finally, I invest a lot of time, a lot of effort into getting this car to move. And then finally it starts to move. And then I'm chugging along. And then the the more time I invest into it, the more and faster and further it starts to go. And then after a certain point, some challenges start to come up. I, uh, you know, I used to spend a lot of time bringing home work after school, you know, and spending a lot of time on my vehicle. And, and then I had my first kid, my son, and then now that time got dramatically reduced. And then, you know, but I'm still working on my vehicle. I'm still like, uh, trying to add to it as much as I can and make it go faster and getting it to run. And then boom, I get a second kid and then bang, like, almost all the time that I have outside of school to invest into my vehicle kind of like just goes away. And it's at this point that I kind of like pop up and I go like, what the heck is going on? Like I'm working so hard to get like, so like, I feel like little results out at the end of it. And if I look at behind me, I see all the younger teachers that are like really working hard and then they're starting to catch up to me and they're moving faster because they have all that time. And then I look at people that are around my age and they all seem to be in the same position I'm in. You know, they start to have kids, start to have other priorities. And then the amount of time that they get to invest into their vehicle becomes less and less. So they start to go at a much slower rate. And then I look way ahead of me at at teachers that are like within five to 10 years of, of, uh, you know, like I want to say graduating, but it's actually retiring uh, from education. And, you know, Like a small portion of them just seem to be moonwalking beside their car to make it look like their car is moving. (laughs) And uh, those are, you know, the hopeless. And then you have those that still maintain hope that are actually zooming off again and they're working really hard and they're moving ahead. And I look at us in the teaching profession as being like on a team that's all in this race together. And one of the things that I notice is if I look way off into the distance, way past those older teachers that are off and zooming uh, ahead of everyone, I notice that, you know, there's like, there's more cars way out there. And as I take out my binoculars and I start to look, I notice that we're way behind in this race. And all these different countries, I can spot out Canada, I can spot out Singapore, I can spot out uh, all these different countries that are just so far ahead of us. And one of them catches my eye, this navy blue and white team uh because they're not even in cars they're in bikes and and they seem to be like leisurely strolling in their bikes and they seem to be maintaining in the top five position of this race right and they look relaxed they look like you know they're having a great old time and that's what really caught my attention about Finland, right? Is that it, they almost make it look effortless. And the more I look at them and how they work, I'm like, wow, this is way different than what we're doing. And they're getting much, much better results. So I was excited to hear about a book that was written from the perspective of a 
teacher from the United States who worked in Massachusetts, an elementary school teacher by the name of uh, Timothy D. Walker. And what he did is uh, he was working here in the United States. He was working on his master's program. He was going through the same struggles that I was going through at the beginning of my career. And then uh, his wife, who's from Finland, says like, well, you're, you seem to be killing yourself over this. Why don't we just move back to Finland by my family and you won't have to kill yourself for your career. And so he, you know, decides, all right, I'm going to Finland. And then he picks up teaching in Finland. And he writes this book based on his experiences contrasting how we teach in the United States versus how things are done in Finland. And that is this book, Teach Like Finland, 33 Simple Strategies for Joyful Classrooms. And joyful is going to be a really important word in his book uh, that I'll go into later. And, uh, he takes these lessons and he separates them kind of into five different chapters that are well-being, belonging, autonomy, mastery, and mindset. And today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one strategy from each of those chapters, kind of present it to you guys so you guys have an idea as to what he's talking about and what we can learn. And uh, yeah, and then I'll sum it up at the end and we're going to kick it off by... and. W- one of the reasons, if you haven't heard me talking about Finland before, uh, that I like about them, I wanted to go over this first, um, is that Finland has this high success rate in tests and uh, as seen by PISA scores and TIM scores and like all these international tests. And they also tend to have the, one of the highest happiness levels of any other country. And so that's why they stand out to me. And We're going to start off by looking at the first chapter of Tim's book, which is called Well-Being. And the first strategy that we're going to take a look at is called Schedule Brain Breaks. And this story starts off with his experience with a student of his named Sammy, a fifth grader who after I think only a week of class comes up to him going like, I'm going to tear my hair out like this is too stressful. Well, what was too stressful? Well, what Tim had been, there's a law in Finland that basically says that for every 45 minutes of direct instruction, you need to give the students a 15 minute break. And he saw like, all right, a lot of teachers are doing 45 minutes, 15 minute break, 45 minutes, 15 minute break. And in his American mind, he was like, this seems pretty wasteful. How about if I just uh, chunk two of those 45 minutes together and then just give them a 30 minute break afterwards? And that was what was driving this kid crazy. He couldn't, he felt overwhelmed by having to sit and concentrate for 90 minutes, an hour and a half, and then to get a 30 minute break. And that's something he wasn't used to. And that's something that he really didn't like um, about the class and kind of approached Tim about it. And then so Tim was like, all right, let's, let's step back and maybe I should go this 4515 route. And um, this is actually supported by research. Uh, There's a book called Recess, Its Role in Education and Development by Anthony Pellegrini, who's a professor emeritus of educational psychology at the University of Minnesota. And what he did is he ran experiments in U.S. public elementary schools to test the relationship between recess timing and attentiveness. And what one of the things that he found was that children are more attentive after a break than right before a break. And... He did it in a bunch of different schools and a diff- different a bunch of different ways. But one of, that's the pattern that he started seeing is like, look, you give kids a break every so often, they come back refreshed, and then they can start working again. And one of the things that he found was that recess or these breaks didn't necessarily have to take place outdoors. If you just give them a break in your classroom, he started to see a lot of the same results and not just increase attention, but it also increased test scores and motivation. Um, and later on, uh, a lady by the name of Debbie Rea, who was a researcher and kinesiologist, uh, worked with a school in Fort Worth, Texas, where she started working with an elementary where we, she was starting to give like some of the students, a cohort of the students, for 15-minute breaks throughout the day. And she found a lot of the same things, right? She started seeing that students with time started to get more focused and the time that they were in the class, they were more effective. And they also started tattling less, which is kind of nice. There's also more evidence by uh, a professor of psychology called 
uh, Daniel Levinton. And he works uh, as a professor of psychology in behavioral neuroscience and music at McGill University. So that's up in Canada. And he writes, uh, you need to give your brain time to consolidate all the information that's just come in. So he's talking about like, right, you've given them like 45 minutes of work or 40 minutes of work, and they have all this new information in them. They need to relax their brain in order to access all that. So he says, uh, this break allows you to refresh and release all those neural circuits that get all bound up when you're focused. And then that relaxing of that is what allows them to uh, process the information and then also lower their levels back down to a baseline so that they can go again. And he recommends that children shouldn't be overly scheduled. They should have blocks of time to promote spontaneity and creativity. And this is one of the things that I found interesting about Finland is that they look a lot of, at a lot of research. Particularly, they look at a lot of research that's done here in the United States and Canada and elsewhere, and then they bring it back into Finland, and then they start to implement it, and then now they see all these amazing results. And that's the ironic part about that is that in the United States, we don't even use our own research. So you have <laughs> that's kind of odd. Uh, but I really like this idea of like, all right, you need time to process, to relax, to go back down to a baseline before you can go in and start to focus again. And he reviews this other book by this lady who talks about pulsing work where you like as an adult, you can work for like an hour and a half, take a, like a little break and then go back, work another hour and a half, and go through this process or these cycles of work, break, work, break. So what that seems to suggest is that as kids get older and older, you can start to extend the amount of time that they can focus, but you're still going to have to give them those periodic 10 to 15 minute breaks throughout the day. All right, so how would you implement this here in the United States, right? Because we can't really work with our schedules or our schedules are less flexible than they are in Finland. Um, and so one of the ways that you can schedule it is if you have in elementary school, your students, you're, you're pretty much with your students all the time and you can set up so that your lessons are 45 minutes long and then you can give them like a 15 minute break. Uh, if you're in high school and you're teaching like in block periods, uh, you can schedule that in there as well, right? You can have a 45-minute block where the students are working and focused. Give them maybe 10 to 15 minutes to reset themselves and then go back and then invest the rest of the time in your class. And doing that is going to allow them to be more focused. So um, you should offer these uh, breaks throughout the day. And it's really important that they become predictable. Like the students should be able to know when they're going to happen. Oh, another tip for if you're in high school and you're not in block periods, just give the students the last 10 minutes of class. I know this is going to sound like heresy, but just give them that time to kind of reset themselves so that they can be more aware, prepared for the next class. And you might even want to talk to, you know, uh, other teachers in other subjects and see if you can make it like a culture in the school where we're just like, all right, we're just going to give you guys the last five to 10 minutes, relax, get your minds right. So that by the time you get into the next class, you're more focused. And that would be an amazing thing if we could apply that. But, um, uh, if we take a look here at, uh, the qualities of these brain breaks, right? Uh, one of the things that's not really too healthy is like if, if you just release your kids and you have them do something that's also brain intensive, like, all right, now you can have the last 10 minutes of class to read your books. Well, they had just been focusing and now you're asking them to focus again some more. So the three qualities that Tim recommends is that they have a high degree of enjoyment, that they have independence, and that there's some element of novelty. Now, kids get all three of these things through play. And that's why in Finland, they give them 15 minutes, and they don't tell them what to do in 15 minutes. They just open up the door. They go, all right, get out of here. And then they come back uh, before the end of the 15 minutes, and then they start on to their next lesson. And so uh, play is really important. And there's a lot of research on play that seems to be that keep running up against over and over and over again.
Okay, so here's an option uh, because there's not a whole lot of options for high school students, you know, because he's an elementary school teacher. But this is one option that I thought was really cool. And I actually have some experience with this when I was teaching in high school, and that's mindfulness. Uh, There was a, you know, a class where the kids were particularly rowdy. And so what I would do is I would uh, take the last five to 10 minutes of class and I would run through a meditation with them. Now, I can't do meditations because, you know, I'm not qualified (laughs) to do meditations, but um, I had an app that had a whole bunch of meditations and I could set the time and length for these meditations. And I would just do like a five minute meditation. I, you know, max out the volume. I put it on speaker. I'd have all the kids listen to it. They'd all sit. They'd all relax. They would close their eyes. And I did that for a week. And after a week, the kids were like begging for it at the end of every period, right? They were like, please, can we do another meditation, please? And I was like, yeah, I felt pressured by the time constraints of all the things that I need to, you know, get through in the day or in the curriculum. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, But, you know, I felt like one of the surprising things was it really, the kids really yearned for it. Um, so if you want one, uh, there's an exercise that, uh, a book that he recommends actually, which is called Mindfulness by for Teachers by Patricia Jennings. Uh, this was written in 2015. And she recommends exercises that are, or she gives exercises that are intended to promote self-awareness, foster cognitive, emotional, and behavioral self-regulation, and reduce stress. And there's a lot of evidence that mindfulness um, meditate and meditation helps with emotional regulation and focus. So here's a script that she wrote in her book that Tim also offers up. And, it's, uh, and it starts like this. I'm going to try to do my mindfulness voice. Let's see if, we, if I can do that. Um, so here we go. We're going to do a listening activity that will help our minds relax and become more focused. First, let's all sit up nice and tall in our seats with our hands folded in our laps or on the desk. In a few minutes, I'm going to ring this chime and we're going to listen to the sound until it disappears. I find that I can focus my attention on my hearing best when I close my eyes. You can try that, but if you aren't comfortable closing your eyes, you can lower your gaze to your hands, right? And then you ring the chime, let it resonate, and then once it's quiet, then you can get the class started. And that's like a mindful listening exercise. And she gives like mindful walking, mindful like all these different exercises that the kids can do. And from my own experience, I think they would get a lot out of it. And if we made it a habit, right, you might start to see other issues start to go away, like behavioral issues and attentional issues and and even some cognitive issues. And that's really uh, powerful, I think. Uh, There's also, I did some searching on uh, to see if like, all right, is there any like free resources on this? There's a YouTube channel called Great Meditation. And if you go to YouTube and just type in at Great Meditation, and they have a bunch of different um, meditations on there. They have a five-minute meditation that I'll link into the show notes. And yeah, anything that is free, I'm going to try to offer it to you guys uh, as best I can. And, and, And I did listen to them, and they're pretty good from, you know, what little experience I have with meditation. Um. Other ideas you can have is just have some kind of like a library available that you stock up with like not just books, but like magazines and and maybe anything that you find interesting or even just like a picture book that kids can kind of go through during their their brain break. Uh, And it's kind of important, although, you know, it's debatable uh, about like not encouraging them to not be on their cell phones during those brain breaks. Because one of the things that you need that's important for a brain break is that you take a break. If kids are like kind of taking in all this new information through their cell phones, they're not really allowing their brains to have a break or to rest. 
And this is one of the values of boredom, right? <laughs> like, like everybody like is seeking to run away from boredom, but boredom is actually one of the things that actually that helps our brains like process, right? All the things that we've in that we've uh, had. And he does offer some differentiation as well, in that um, because not everyone can focus for forty five minutes, there, you might have students that have trouble for even that long. You might want to create a spot in your classroom that you call the calm spot and, you know, maybe put like a couch or a chair or something that's comfortable to, for them to sit in and it's quiet and maybe a plant or something that they can look at. And so that students, when they feel like they're getting too overwhelmed by everything, can just go sit in the calm spot, chill out for a second and come back at their own uh, when they feel comfortable. Now you do want to watch out that you know, you don't want kids to just come into the classroom straight, <laughs> go straight to the calm spot and hang out there for the entire period because that's, you know, you know, that's not really useful to them. And most importantly, make sure, and again, I said this before, but make sure that these breaks are predictable. Let the kids know, hey, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming, so that their anxiety levels are reduced. And it might take some practice to do this. All right, let's move on to chapter two, which is belonging. And the second strategy that I'm going to go over is called uh, pursue a class dream. And this one I found was really interesting. Um, and it centers around this, I, this thing that happens in Finland at the end of elementary school that's called camp school. And camp school, according to Tim, is a huge celebration of learning in Finland because it's something that comes at the end of the children's elementary school career. And the two aspects that he really liked about it is that it expects a lot of responsibility from students to raise money and, and a lot of money. Like we're talking about thousands of euros per student. Um, fundraising, and they do the fundraising by bake sales, school dances, or any other creative idea that they can to come up with this money. And uh, he also found that attending it builds a lot of unity within a classroom. Um, and you notice like a lot, a huge like change in rapport among the students that go to camp school together. And camp school is like this really big thing that happens every year. Now, we in the United States probably can't do a whole lot of camp school. Maybe you, I know when I was in elementary school, we had something like it. It was like, it was our sixth grade retreat. And uh, where my high, where my elementary school, we would go to a camp together um, you know, of course, but we wouldn't have to do all the other parts to go to the camp school other than just have our parents pay. Uh, whereas here, the impetus is on, hey, you as a class want to go to camp school. So you as a class have to assist each other in raising up the money in order to go to camp school. So it's a lot of responsibility that you're putting upon the students. Um, now, camp school isn't going to be available for everyone, but it, what you can do is you can have what's called a class dream. And a class dream is kind of like in place of the camp school. And this is just something that you guys as a class want to do together. Now, uh, in my experience, one of the things that I really like doing with my, uh, some of my students was taking them to science museums, right? And I would let them choose. I'd give them like a whole bunch of brochures and, and things to look at. And I'm like, hey, look. Or I'd send them to websites and I'd say, hey, here's a bunch of museums and a bunch of like science centers that we would go to that we can go to. And if we work hard, if we raise enough money, if, you know, then we can go together. And I found that that was really a positive experience in, in my, you know, in my history of teaching. Um, other ideas that Tim offers is you could like produce a music album uh, where the kids actually write and do all the music, maybe even do a music video. You could hike a mountain, you could create a learning app, you could do whatever it is. But the most important thing is that you as a teacher and your students have to make this decision together. So this is the first step to implementing having a class dream is come up with the dream together. You got to be very wary because this is one of the things that Tim fell into is that he decided that he was going to plan what it was and he had an idea as to what he wanted to do in terms of like 
uh, helping uh, Paralympians. And, and he had this whole lesson plan set out. And when he tried to implement it, because the students didn't select that, he got a lot of pushback and a, a lot of demotivated students. So it's really important that the students feel like they have some kind of a choice and that their choice matters right, in implementing this class stream. So come up with them together. So how do you do that? Um, one idea is what I call sum the ranks. Sum the ranks um, is this idea that I learned from, I think it's a Kagan strategy, but you start off by, let's say you want to come up with a class stream as a class together. You have every student come up with like maybe two or three ideas individually. And you go like, all right, everyone just come up like, what would be a, something cool that we could do together as a class? Um, and you can set other parameters if you want, but it's not really necessary to do that. And then just have the kids think. And then once they think, you can give them like a couple minutes and then you tell them, all right, what I want you to do is I want you to look at your own list and I want you to pick like the top, what's the thing that you want to do the most on that list? And then what you're going to do is you're going to share that with the other three members in your group. So I had my class set up in groups of four. So you have them share out in groups of four what their ideas, and then you give them like a little note card and you tell them like, all right, I want you to write your ideas uh, along the x-axis and along the y-axis. I want you guys to put your names and I want you guys to take turns ranking all of the ideas, right? So all the kids rank the ideas. So, you know, uh, you'll have one kid that ranks, you know, let's say the idea is like, all right, science museum, uh, natural history museum, uh, build a community garden, and uh, I don't know, uh, go to a camp. Let's that, have that one be the fourth one. And so each kid will rank those, you know, one through four. And then what you do is you add up all the scores for each category and whichever one gets the least amount that becomes the best choice for the group right so the smallest number gets the best group that's why it's called sum the ranks you add them up and the lowest number is the one that wins uh, because more people pick that as first or second on their rankings and then you can do that get their ideas and then you can do it all over again as a class and you can use a spreadsheet to kind of get everyone to vote on what each group came up with. And then that becomes, and then whatever gets the, the, high, the lowest number in the rankings as a class gets to be the class dream. And that's a very fair way. Everyone gets their, to have their input. And it's really like, I found every time I did some of the ranks as a class, it, it always worked out great. All right. Next so you, now you have your idea. What you want to do now is create some roles for everyone, right? And uh, this could be in terms of like, all right, let's say that you want to go to a science museum. Well, you're going to have to do some research, right? So you can have a group of kids and you're going to go like, all right, you guys are going to be the research. And what you're going to do is you're going to look at activities and how much this costs. And you guys are going to come up with that information in a week from today right? And, or maybe even give them some class time to do this. So they come up with that information and then you assign a different set of students, like a different role. And you can go like, all right, you guys are going to be my fundraising com com committee. Now, how are we going to raise, we know that we need to raise, you know, like, I don't know, $20 per, per student or $30 per student, whatever it is. How are we going to raise that money? And they can come up with, all right, ideas for how to do that. And you can have another committee that actually implements those ideas. And you can have like another committee and you just break up the roles so that everyone in the class gets to participate in coming up with these, uh, with, uh, you know, whatever things or activities that you need to do in order to com complete the project. And this the important role for the teacher is you're going to be there kind of helping them make decisions, but you're not going to be participating in those, right? So like, let's say you're, there's like a bake sale that the kids want to do. You as a teacher are just there to kind of give them the supplies and, and cultivate their ability to like get this bake sale. 
you as a teacher are not to build to bake all the <laughs> bake all the the goods that are going to be sold because it's not your responsibility. And you that's one of the things that you have to constantly remind yourself is this is the responsibility of the students. This is not my responsibility because it's what they want to do. Every time you take on a responsibility that should go to the students, it winds up like actually demotivating the students, right? <laughs> Which is kind of weird, but that's uh, the way it works. And you can also invite other people to be a part of this process. Now, a couple of different pe- places that you can look at is A, parents, right? Now, what you can do is you can put parents, you can assign a parent like liaison. And if you guys are going to be going doing some kind of a field trip, you can put the parent in charge of, hey, uh, here's the number of all the other parents. Uh, could you see if you, who wants to be a chaperone, right? Or could you communicate to them where we're going to be going or what we need for a fundraiser? And then you can have a parent that kind of spreads the news amongst all the other parents so that you as a teacher aren't all in charge of that. And then parents are going to want to do that because they, you know, they want to make their class good. They want to participate in their students' education. And that would be awesome. Uh, if parent, you can have parents and you can also look at other teachers, right? Uh, particularly if you're in an elementary school, one of the things that I find over and over again in research is the value of connecting younger students with older students. And the prime age seems to be around three to four years age difference, right? So if you have a group of first graders, maybe uh, getting them access to fourth and fifth graders to help them, uh, you know, like do whatever it is that they need to do, right? Like, let's say they need to learn how to bake something or bake cookies or something. The older students could teach the younger students how to do that. Or if they want to make signs, the older students can help the younger students make those signs. And you can recruit older teachers to kind of help you and build these relationships across the ages, which would be awesome. So those are some ideas on how to decide the roles, how to bring in other people. And next is uh, if there's big decisions that need to be made, make sure that you make them democratically, right? So this could either be through summing the ranks or whatever, but allow the class to vote on the details of the dream. Like if you're going to go on a field trip, everyone has to vote on where that's going to be. If they're going to go on a field trip or they're going to do some sort of activity, everyone has to vote on what activities you want to do when you get there. Or everyone wants should vote on how to spend money once you get there. And all of these like decisions that are coming from the students really, really helps them buy into the project because now what they're going to want to do is they're going to want to participate, right? Now they're going to feel the pressure and there's going to be a big payoff at the end. And that big payoff is seeing the fruits of all their labor. So one of the things to look out for is if you guys are going to go on some kind of a trip, try your best, do everything you can to get every student to go, right? Uh, Because Tim Walker noticed that in some of the trips that he went on, maybe two or three of the kids had to be left behind for because they couldn't go or they didn't want to go for personal reasons. And when the class got back from their trip together, they were the ones that kind of felt left out after all the activities were done. Not only that, but they also probably helped in creating those activities and then they didn't wind up getting to go to them at all at the end. And so that is a tragedy all on its own as well. So that's how you do a class stream. Uh, And last is, or not last, this is going to be like the third strategy. And this is the next chapter, which is titled Autonomy. And the strategy that I chose out of here was uh, plan with your students. And this planning with your students is one of the, I've seen it in a bunch of different places and you can start small, and the, the way I'm going to describe it to you is going to be like how to help incorporate students into your planning, into your lesson planning, uh, in a small way. So this starts off with like uh, a story that Tim was telling in ethics class. Now, this is one of the cool things that they have in, in uh, Finland that we don't have here is an actual ethics class in elementary school, right, which is pretty cool. 
but uh, they were discussing democracy at a macro level. And so Tim was like, oh, okay, you guys want to learn about democracy? I'm going to show you Sudbury Valley School. So for those of you that don't know what Sudbury Valley School is, Sudbury Valley School is a school that has zero curriculum. And um, it's a really interesting school in Farmingham, Massachusetts, or I think it's Framingham, Massachusetts. And what they do is they have no curriculum. The kids are free to come and go like uh, in and out of buildings in the school and if they're younger than eight, then they need an escort to leave the campus, but they can. And there's woods nearby that the kids can go and explore in. And, you know, there's teachers, but like the teachers have to get voted in by the students or they can get voted out by the students. Uh, there's uh, these votes that happen from time to time to decide on the policies and the administration, teachers and students all have equal votes because there's more students than anything else. And that means really the power is in within the students that decide to show up for, for anything. And so this is a, a really uh, interesting school. So he shows them a video about Sudbury Valley and then he asks them, hey, uh, what do you guys think of this? Is this the kind of like education system that you guys would want? It would give you maximal autonomy. And then to his surprise, the students looked at that and they're all like, that sounds horrible. <laughs> like, like, yes, we want autonomy. Yes, we want to make our own decisions, but we don't want to be alone while we do all that. And that like really stuck in, in Tim's mind. And, you know, it makes sense. Um, and so he came up with this idea of like co-planning and co-planning is uh, kind of taking like the best of both worlds and sharing the responsibility of determining the direction of learning, Right. And there's some legislation that's kind of pushing uh, their education system in this way. So Tim writes, uh, as Finland seeks to emphasize the importance of developing student agency in its new curriculum reform, it's requiring that all Finnish comprehensive schools, so that's grades one through nine, uh, develop and offer one interdisciplinary unit of study, which is of particular interest to the children per school year for all students. Additionally, it's expected that the children help plan these interdisciplinary units of study. So you're trying to get the students involved in all of this, right? And it ha the, the interest has to come from them. Uh, so again, they're kind of trying to teach their kids to be as autonomous as possible. So how do you implement this? Uh, to co-create... Uh, a project, you can start off with a project, right? So go through a unit of study. And at the end of the unit, you can create a project that's kind of based on whatever it is that you had learned. The very first step is going to be to brainstorm ideas of different examples of a particular subject. So like, and the subject could be anything. It could be like energy conversions. It could be tragic heroes. It could be geometry and architecture, right? Um, and whatever the unit of lesson is, have the kids research all the applications of that unit. And that's going to be a really important way to kind of get the kids thinking about, all right, how's this going to look like outside of the classroom, which is really important. And that's what, you know, that's the experience that you kind of want to give your students uh, to help them like kind of develop an idea as to what the outside world looks like. Uh, next, what you're going to do is you're going to investigate, once you've picked a topic, you're going to investigate this topic in more detail with your students and start with like an outline. And you can organize an outline on Google Slides or even Google Docs or whatever learning management system that you have. But just start with an outline of, all right, this is the thing that we're going to be investigating. We're, we, were investi we did our unit of uh, energy conversions. Now we're going to be investigating solar panels and how do solar panels take energy from the sun and then turn them to you know, into energy to power your PlayStation or whatever, your TV, your phone, your whatever. And you can outline that as a class, right? Have the kids come up with like, all right, what are all the aspects of this? What do we need to know? What do we need to understand? What do you want to know about, right? And then once you have your outline, you can take your students, put them into small groups and give them chunks of the outline to go investigate. Say, hey, you're going to investigate you know, uh, wiring, you're going to investigate solar panels, you're going to investigate uh, how energy is transferred 
from one location to another location. Like just give them parts of that outline that they came up with to, you know, try and go and research. All right. So now that they do their research and now that it's all organized uh, into an outline, uh, what you're going to want to do is you're going to org- further organize your outline into something that you're going to present somewhere, right? So it could be a presentation, like a Google Slides presentation. It could be like a paper that they write together. It could be a skit or a project that they want to do on campus or like it, just something, some kind of a product. And so you need the product and you also need the audience, who are they going to present this to? Are they going to present this to another class? Are they going to present this to younger students, to older students? Are, you going to, are they going to invite somebody onto campus that's an expert and to present them ideas? Are they going to, like, do they have a project that they want to propose so they need to present this to the principal or vice principals? Like, who is their audience that they want to hit with this presentation? So once they have, like, their product or thing that they want to do, their proposal, then you give them time in class to kind of like work on that. And it doesn't have to be all the time in the world. Uh, it could be, you could give them like some amount of time. We're going to spend 10 hours on this project. And here's when I'm going to give you these times, right? It's going to be every Monday and Wednesday from this time to this time. Or it could be, I'm just going to give you Friday's periods for the next couple of weeks to do this, right? And once they have all of that set up, and they work on it, and they start to research it, and they start to put it together, your role as a teacher is just to kind of look at the at what they're putting together, and from time to time, just facilitate it, right? Like, like make them cognizant of how much time they have left, and ask them questions about what they have in their presentation. You can go say, like, hey, I don't understand this part. This part seems a little bit hazy. Like, do you think you could make it a little bit better, or do you think there's some more questions that are coming out of this? And really poke and prod their their work so that they can, with the goal of trying to make it better and better and better and better. But again, it's going to have to be up to them to create this thing. Uh, Once, as they're working on that, you can even take a cohort of them or you can do this as a class, is create an assessment, right? So if somebody sees this presentation, what are the key ideas that they should get out of it? And can you make like an informal assessment out of this? So you could even take it, take that information, turn it into a Kahoot or, you know, turn it into some other small quiz or turn it into like, you know, a Jeopardy type game or something that the kids can kind of partake in to make sure that they understand all this. One of the things that uh, is important about this is it might be a good idea to not grade this project. Uh, when you start to put like things like grades, you know, or start to get like, then it starts to shift the focus from, you know, the learning to getting a good grade. And that's a big focus shift. And you want to be really cognizant of that focus shift. All right. So things to remember is uh, put an emphasis on what, what is it that the students want to know and carve out regular time for students to work on the project and make them cognizant of each time that comes up, how much time they have left, right? And this way, it kind of gives them motivation. So like, oh, I, gotta, I only have an hour. I only have two hours. I got to really work on this and kind of puts an impetus on them. And it might take a few times to try and figure out how much time should they get, right? All right. The next chapter, the fourth chapter in Tim's book is called Mastery. And I decided to take the strategy called Prove the Learning. Uh, and Prove the Learning is, uh, in, is, you know, it's kind of like an assessment type thing. One of the things that Tim noticed when he went from the United States over to Finland was the amount of summative assessments that Finland gives. Some like Finland probably gives equal to or more summative assessments than we do over here in the United States. Everybody though looks at Finland and goes like, oh look, they have no standardized tests. Yes, summative assessments and standardized tests are are actually two different kinds of things, right? The standardized test is coming is like from the top down. It's like the state coming down, you know, and saying, like, hey, here's the test that you guys need to take. Uh, a summative assessment is kind of like more from the bottom up. It's something that the teachers create to give to the students. 
and it gives them an idea as to what they're working with, and they can take that information and even push it out to the community if they wanted to, right? It also allows teachers to modify their curriculum to fit the needs of their students, and that's a big advantage of having things bottom-up versus top-down. When things are coming top-down, the amount of differentiation that you can do to suit the needs of your students becomes less and less and less. And that's a huge problem. And it's a huge problem that we have here in the United States. So uh, there's only one standardized test in Finland, and that's called the matric- matriculation examination. And it's at the end of their like high school kind of thing. They don't really have high school. They have like primary school and secondary school. So Secondary school is kind of similar to our high school. And once they meet the requirements in classes, they can go ahead and take that if they want to go into a four-year university. So not everyone has to take go through the matriculation examination. And starting in the fall of 2016, elementary school children are de-emphasizing number grades in lieu of narrative feedback at the end of each marking period. So even they don't like tests, So they're starting to move away from it. So instead of giving their kids like number grades, they used to give them grades in elementary school from four to 10, four being the lowest grade, 10 being the highest grade. And now they're trying to phase those out uh, for narrative um, like feedback. So basically like, oh, your student needs to work on these letters or on this like type of math or they're, you know, like this is how, these are the things that they've mastered. It's more narrative so that you know it puts the emphasis more on what it is that they're learning versus on a number or a letter or something that they're trying to achieve and that's really important okay now uh they also focus on this word called perustella and perustella uh basically means justify your work and it's common in all their summative assessments to and even in their matriculation exam to have Pergustella, right? And that is justify your work, justify your work. Uh, he cites Pazi Salberg on this. So if you haven't read, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, Finnish Lessons. So there's Finnish Lessons. I think it's up to 3.0 now, but he quotes 2.0. And he talks about, Pazi Salberg talks about like the difference in the exams. So he writes, the nature of these, he's talking about the matriculation exam. Uh, The nature of these individual exams is to try to test students' ability to cope with unexpected tasks, whereas the California high school exit examination, for example, is guided by a list of potentially biased, sensitive, or controversial topics to be avoided. The Finnish examination does the opposite. Students are regularly asked to show their ability to deal with war or with issues related to evolution, losing a job, dieting, political issues, violence, war, ethics and sports, junk food, sex, drugs, and popular music. Such issues span across subject areas and often require multidisciplinary knowledge and skills. So that's from Finnish Lessons 2.0. The key idea here is, is a shift in mindset. Do you want your students, do you want to shelter your students from the world? Or do you want them to be strong enough to deal with the world? And that is the main difference between the California high school exit exam and the Finnish matriculation exam, is that one of them is trying to shelter students from the world, whereas the other one is trying to have them head head on, right? And I really like that idea of, hey, you know, we're we're not going to shy away from, you know, potentially dangerous subjects. We're going to go all in and you better be ready for it. I really like that idea. Um, And yeah, I found it like really interesting. So summative assessments that are, uh, so how do you implement this? What you want to do is you want to create summative assessments that are open-ended and that force students to think creatively and critically. And those are the key ideas. And One of the things that he suggests is like, if you're going to grade this, know what to grade. So he awards points to providing pieces of evidence, to showing knowledge, to understanding of a particular content area. And 
one of the things he found is when he started rolling out these kinds of assessments that forced students to think creatively and critically, the students really enjoyed it and really like liked trying to show off how creative they can be or how critically they can think. And so he gives some examples of what these questions look like. And, and these are for elementary school, but you can kind of scale them up to a uh, high school level if you wanted to. So there's different topics. Uh, physics. Let's take a look at a physics question. Uh, explain how earthing works. In your explanation, refer to the term lightning conductor. Write sentences and create a label diagram to support your explanation. So that has many parts, right? And not only like explain like explain how this thing works, but how do you know, right? Draw me a picture. How does this work in detail? Uh, geography, what is the difference between a vegetation zone and a climate zone? Explain in words and create a diagram if it supports your explanation. History, why did people migrate to Finland? Explain your thinking. Chemistry, imagine that you have been asked to find out whether toothpaste is acidic or alkaline. Uh, Thinking like a scientist, what would you do? So one of the important things is each question has a second part. And that second part is forcing them to like explain themselves. And one of the things that you want to do if you want students to be successful at this is don't just wait for the summit of assessment to ask them to justify themselves. Students should be justifying their answers throughout the class, right? In class discussions, if they give you an answer, tell them, well, how do you know that? Why? Right? When they're working in groups, encourage them to ask each other that. In uh, formative assessments, right? If you're giving them some kind of um, like even like simple end of the day quiz, have justification be a part of that. And the more they get used to justifying their answers and being able to say why they know what they know, the easier it is going to be for them and they can uh, start to think more critically. And then now, when by the time they get to the front summit of assessment, they're prepared to do that. And so that is Peristella right there. Justify your work, right? Why is that the answer? How do you know? All right. The last chapter is called Mindset. And the final strategy is don't forget joy. <laughs> now, that's a weird one, but it's really apt to the title because, you know, the title is uh, 33 Simp Simple Strategies for Joyful Classrooms. Um, and so joy is one of the really important things because it you, students tend to learn better when they feel like their teachers are warm and caring and supportive and even just happier in general. Um, then he kind of cites some research. Uh, there was this uh, PhD student named Alejandro Adler uh, who was uh, getting his PhD in positive psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. And he co conducted a study with 18 schools in Bhutan. And this involved like thousands of students. I think it's something like 8,000 students. And so he implemented classroom. So classrooms implemented a happiness curriculum, which emphasized 10 non-academic life skills like mindfulness, interpersonal relationships, and self-awareness, or a placebo curriculum. And then what they did is they gave them this curriculum, and then they tested them afterwards, and they gave them tests for well-being and standardized test scores. And what they found is students that had this happiness curriculum scored better in both. And what this means is that well-being fosters academic achievement. And those two things, you cannot separate from one another. And we know this at like some level, at an instinctive level, uh, because like if you have a student that's starving or that's hungry or that doesn't feel like they have consistent shelter or doesn't feel safe, they are going to struggle to learn because they have all these other needs that have not been met yet, Right. But once those needs have been met, then they can start to learn. And what this does is it starts to look at students as more than just needing physical needs, right? Like safety and, and uh, being fed and having like shelter. It also says like, well, they have mental needs as well, right? And well-being needs that are things that are not so concrete as having a meal. 
And if you give students both of those things, then they can be successful at being a student. And the new Finnish curriculum actually emphasizes joy as a com as a concept, as a learning concept. So they're trying to push joy into the classroom so that students can, you know, have not just their physical needs met, but their mental needs met as well. And that allows them to propel forward. So this technique is more about like the teacher than it is the students because, um, you know, the teacher's mental health also matters. Our mental health matter. Um, and if we aren't there mentally for the students, then, you know, we can't expect the students to be there mentally either. And so what he says is like, if you are going through some kind of a tough time, right? Uh, a parent is giving you a hard time. Uh, admin is giving you more things to adding more things to your plate. Or if you're feeling like you need to catch up on grading, uh, try to find some things that are going to bring joy into your life. And it could be something as simple as, all right, I'm going to take a pause. I'm going to try to find something around me that I'm grateful for, all right? Could it be family? Could it be uh, something that, a relationship that you're establishing, um, the interaction that you had with that second grade or that second period student that, that you know, brought a smile to your face? Something to be grateful for. And really don't stop until you find that one thing or maybe even two things. And then take a deep breath and then start to move forward again. Uh, another thing that you can do is uh, ask yourself, what is something that I can do now that's going to make me happier in five minutes or tomorrow or next week or at the end of the semester? And then start working on that thing, right? Right. Uh, a lot of being happy is planning for the future and asking yourself, all right, what do I need to do, right? And you can think of it as, as something as simple as like, all right, I'm really struggling. I'm trying to get through my grading. I'm having a hard time. I'm going to go take out the ice cream from the freezer so that it can be uh, soft enough for me to scoop out later, right? <laughs> something simple like that. Uh, and that's planning for the future. In five minutes, you're going to really enjoy that ice cream and you can do that right now. And just having like these little setups for happiness in the future is going to allow you to withstand all the hard times that come in your day-to-day -day of being a teacher, really, right? And so joy is a priority as much as grading, dealing with parents, uh, getting through your curriculum, right? Uh, make that a priority as well. And that's it. That's all five chapters of his book. And what I really liked about it is that it starts to take a look at people as more than just their academic successes or more than just like how much curriculum you can get through. Um, one of the things I want to make a note of too is uh, as teachers, we feel all this pressure, especially nowadays with more and more standards being given to us, with more and more tests being given to us or with the tests constantly changing that uh, it's a lot of pressure that's being put down on, on you as teachers. And try not to give in to that pressure. One of the biggest things that helped me out a lot was uh, when I just told myself one day, you know, towards the end of my teaching, like, I'm not going to get through all these standards. I can't. It's impossible for me. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick the most important things that I see I'm like, all right, what's the most important thing to chemistry? What's the most important thing to physics? And I'm going to focus on those things and only those things. And hey, if I can add in some more later, if I get good at this, I can start to add in some more things later. But it's okay that I don't hit every single standard. It's okay. And don't feel bad about doing that. If you look at the curriculum framework in California, the science framework alone is something like 50. Uh, no, it's like 3,000 pages, you know? The entire framework in Finland is like 50 pages. So it's like like we, we are being overloaded left and right. And then now we're being asked more and more to like, all right, now not only do you have to give a curriculum to your students, we have all these SEL, social emotional learning, that you need to implement into your classroom as well, right? And now we're making teachers responsible for more and more things, without taking off anything off the plate, 
And that's just unfair to teachers, right? That's untenable. We cannot do that. And so don't feel bad, right? Like in the end, what's more important, you know, that they know uh, every little detail about the periodic table or that they are seen as holistic people, right? As whole beings, right? All right. That has concludes uh, episode 30 of the Less Is More Education podcast. Thank you for listening to the Less Is More Education podcast. If you would like to support the podcast at the cost of less than one coffee a month, visit patreon.com forward slash less is more education. If you prefer reading about the research most relevant to pedagogy and education policy, just visit less is more education dot substack dot com. Thank you.